only uh, sort of uh, having one sort of uh, enzyme in a, a cage is called Amy. And so we're using this Amy, and we use this kind of simple coupling process to make this Amy and bring a ferrocene into the structure. So you just boil the coarse material with the anhydride, with this anhydride, and you end up with the structure where the ferrocene is inside of the tube. And so you can see the ferrocene is in this cage here, in the zinc form, you can see one. Well, this is the min 53, this is another tiny form, and we have a ferrocene here. Now you can ask, how do you know the ferrocene is there? And the drawing here sort of implies the crystal structure, but we don't have a crystal structure. This, this is just um, a pretty picture, and all we have is crystal, but all we have is elemental analysis. So from elemental analysis, it's possible to say how much hydrogen is there, and so we can say how much ferrocene is contained in these Cages. But we have a covalent bound of kerosene inside. And then we look at the end of chemistry. Kerosene is the most friendly molecule for adding a chemistry because it always just one electron oxidation, one electron reduction. It's always the best molecule to use. But if you put it into a moth, into a box, it becomes very complicated. And so when we started looking at this, this is the UFC one. And so there are two processes. There's first a small process and then a second big process. And if I cycle a few times, the big process disappears. So actually we are destroying our material here, we are destroying the compound for some reason. And more interesting is pH. So if we change the pH, we can see the signals shifting. This line here is the indication for a signal changing 60 millivolt for every pH. That's typical for phenols, for redox systems which are pH dependent. Kerosene is not pH dependent. So, why do we see the signature? And so, the only way to explain this really is to say the kerosene has become pH dependent. So, now what happens is the kerosene is in the pore, we are taking the electron out, it becomes positive, and the next thing that happens is the proton escapes from the pore. So, we are coupling the proton exchange electron exchange, and it becomes pH dependent. And so both of these processes, the small one and the big one, both show this kind of pH dependence. And, and we sort of interpret this as the first one, the small signal, is a surface signal. So on the surface of our morph, we can be able to transport the electrons, and it sort of just affects the surface. And then if we put it into the material, we need more energy, so we have a bigger hand here. And as soon as we do this, if we drill into the material, it also breaks down. If we work at organic solvent, it's much simpler. You only see this one. This is just this first process. The bulk process is not observed. And so it's, it's typically for water with a proton exchange. It's like that it's kind of breaking down. The same for the other material. This is the aluminium. This is the mill 53. Process 1, process 2. And so you can see this is the sketch basically. We have kerosene, we take away one electron, and we have a proton removed from the cage. And so you end up with a core which is very alkaline, and the alkaline core just dissolves the moth. If you take the moth material and you put it into a sodium hydroxide, it will dissolve. And that's a sort of known process for, the, for analysis of these materials. So this actually sort of dissolves the inside out. So it's not, it's not good use for our plan to absorb CO2 and to reduce it. But it's very interesting to look at these four processes. Next, we look at two other redox systems. We found that if we can't bind directly the redox ferrocene material, we may be absorb other molecules. So I have two examples of this. Alizari is something. This is Alizari by gas. It's a nice two electron. Reduction, and then I have the second reaction. Uh, this is this is the anion. So it's the anion that you have chosen the catalyst. And this is the, the structure. We have about one of these molecules for each Z4 plus star. It's you can see from the color. At first, it's a white material, then it goes dark. And the alizarin gray gas has a nice property, it's like a, its own indicator. If I look at the 
processes as a function of the age, and this is the potential, the, there are two reductions. There's the reduction of the of this quinone. I'm not interested at the moment in the oxidation, that's just because of the quinone reduction. So this alpha quinone unit here, there are two electrons, so you have this complete reduction to the two electron process. And, um, and it's possible to have another process at a different pH, another process at a different pH. So actually there are three kinds of processes. And in, in this plot, if you sort of try to, to see how this happens, if I, if I start here at pH 7, I will see this process, process 1. And then, because in this process I'm consuming protons, I'm moving the pH. So I'm moving along this line, and I'm then looking at process 2. So first I see process 1, and then I see process 2. And if it's even more alkaline, I see process 4. Or if I add acid, I see process 3. So there's sort of individual processes which really have what's the pH in the environment of this <laughs> and so here, this is in solution, you can see no material load, it's just a solution experiments. The first and the second process, this is its kind of pH effect. You can see the first process, and then the process stops, and then it starts again because it's from alkaline, you can see the second process. If I use the material in the MOF, in the course, again, for two processes, or if I use a little bit of acid, I can start initially with pH with, with process 3, it's an acidic process, a small signal, and then there's almost nothing, and then a much more negative potential, I see a process 4. And so this indicates that there's a big jump in pH. So inside of the pore, it's gone from acidic all the way to alkaline, and when it's alkaline, then the reduction of this isotopic in the pore actually is breaking up the solid and it's releasing the dye into the solution. We wanted to test this and we put this platinum wire over the surface. So there's the carbon surface modified with the moth and this platinum wire we can, we can pick up the product. So just if something is produced we can detect it on the wire. And we can see that if we run this cyclic protonogram on the wire we can see here approximately we can pick up the, the dye. So the dye is, is released into the solution, so that means it's breaking up the solid. We tried different solvents. This was water. In ethanol, it's the same. Process 1, process 2, process 3, process 4. With the message, or in acetonitrile, process 1, process 2, process 3, process 4. So it doesn't depend on what's outside. It's all inside of the material. It's the pore process, and it's the alkaline emissions in the pore which actually break up this kind of material. And that sort of fits very well with the ferrocene result. So it's quite sensitive to real processes inside. So you get the effect of protons due to the proton expulsion, you get alkaline emissions, and you get anionic dye expulsion from the, from the pore. Okay, I thought then let's try a cationic dye. If the anionic dye is actually released out of the solution, maybe we can try a cationic dye. Methylene blue is also a really nice redox system. And we have the methylene blue, this is the molecule, it's an aromatic molecule, it's a dipeptide in acidic conditions, and we can reduce by two electrons. The nice thing about this process is that the process is about minus 0.21 volts, which is just about right for the C2 electrons. So the idea was to absorb this. See, this is the starting material, it's a white powder. And when it's absorbed, it's blue. It's a nice blue color for the dye inside the pores. The solid looks like this, and so the chunks of material. And we have, in this case, about half a methylene half a methylene blue molecule every zinc four cluster inside the, into the moth. When I change pH, this material also switches up a little bit the mechanism. It's not so big. We go from this mechanism to a single electron mechanism. So here we have simultaneous two electron reduction. And then if I go alkaline, I actually have two one energy reduction processes. And this is what we see with the both as well. So the behavior really follows the, the solution processes. In a semi condition, one nice signal, in alkaline conditions, two split signals. And so this is showing pH 2, 7, and 12. So it's going really from one signal and splits into two. So all of this really looks like a solution experiment 
and it follows this kind of pattern where the signal splits at about pH 8. And all of this tells us it's probably on the surface of the morph. It's not going into the pores, into the deeper pores of the morph material. What we're looking at is the chemistry on the surface or even in solution. So maybe we are looking at both pore processes at the surface, or maybe in the solution. So to test this idea, we have a double electron experiment. And so the idea is to measure how fast is the mobility of charges. And so we have two electrons with a very small gap. And so this we call the junction. And uh, you can see this is two micrometer. And so this gap here between the two electrons is actually about 400 nanometer. And we're using an iron beam mill to, to cut through this material and to have the small gap. The reason for the small gap is that uh, you can measure very slow charge transport. And if something happens on the solid surface or in the solid, typically diffusion rates are about uh, a million times or 100,000 times less than in solution. And so it has to be a really small gap in order to find the speed of the material moving across. And so we have our material, we put it over the surface, and we measure one electrode, and we just pick up the signal from the second electrode. And from the shape of this, we can estimate the diffusion rate of the charge. And, and so we get this 10 minus 15. So this really rules out a solution, uh, solution transport. Yeah, this process has to be in the pores, but it sort of goes over the surface of the model TPA. So it's, it's a bit like sort of popping over the surface and it's going along the surface from one electron to the other surface. So it's, it's a confined process, but probably happening at the surface of the model. And, and so all of this really sort of, um, sort of leads me to the conclusion. First of all, these, these processes in MOF pores are really complicated. If you're doing electrochemistry inside of a MOF, is, is quite tricky and probably it needs something that's self-healing. You want something which even break the breaks up, it will fall back into the same structure. And um, so it requires a stable framework and mobilize real science and a self-healing material. And so that's the end of the first part of the talk. It's the, the morph materials. And um, I hope we have some more candidates for some more materials we can look at. But uh, there's more to do. The last Oh, the last few slides is about the polymers with intrinsic polyporosity. And I try to, I try to think of a, of a picture which uh, gives you the right impression. If you think of these two materials here, let's take this one first. This material is a typical polymer material. It's flexible because it has this kind of component here. And um, this material here is like a, a leather structure. So you can see this has no, no single bond completely rigid. And so if this one forms a solid, where both of them dissolve in chloroform, you can evaporate, you can make a nice fluid. But if you evaporate this one, you end up with a structure like this. It's a really open structure with lots of pores. And the BET, the absorption uh, surface area, is massive. This is a thousand meters square per gram. So if you take a gram, that's basically two football fields of surface area. And they look the same, they, look, they both look like nice polymers, but this one is really has an open structure. This is a classical polymer, you can see 30 meters per gram, it's not very interesting, it's sort of all together. And so what can we do with this material in terms of chemistry? We have both of these materials from Professor Neil McHugh, he's at Edinburgh University, so we don't actually make these materials, we, we collaborate, we get these materials. So we gave us these two, P1 and P2, and we compare the behavior of the two. This one is not very special, it's not very interesting really, but this one has a lot of interesting properties. So the rest of the talk is just about this one polymer. And you can see there's an interesting structural unit. You know Dunco is, is a typical organic base where you have two nitrogens, and that's used for, for synthetic properties. This is a sort of type of gap here, this is a type of diamine which is in the structure. And so these amines can be protonated, and so that will have some important effects on the ion mobility. We found that, for example, if you have a little bit of acid present, we can absorb anions. This is a photograph. And so here, this is the polymer without any treatment. This is the polymer with tetrachloro palladium solution, just soaked 
you salt for 10 minutes, you take the foam off, it's actually full of the, of the yellow color of that color there. And well, this is the uh, it's an indigo color, and it's a blue color, it's an aromatic color um, we can it's, it's color. In this case, we used another trick. This is using a mixture of water ethanol. So if you have only water, the dye will not absorb. But if you take a mix of a mixture of ethanol water, you can absorb the dye. And it's then possible to, to quantify how much is absorbed, just to be visible. And it's possible to do an chemistry with these materials. And, and one interesting result was the electrochemistry of palladium. So if I take this polymer, I put this over the electrical surface, and I play the palladium, so I make palladium metal, we get lamina, we get sort of not much sort of nanoparticles, so we don't get crystals of palladium, we get blades of palladium. So this is a TEM structure, and you can see there's layers of palladium. So it looks like the polymer somehow is sort of guiding the, the growth of palladium, and it forms these layers of palladium.